Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to the Forest Service Institute's Mabini Dialogue Series on Recalibrate or Reinvent, the Impact of Industry 4.0 and Demographic Change on ASEAN's Economic Integration and the Philippines. Today we're privileged to have two gentlemen who are well distinguished in their respective fields. But before we proceed with the discussion, allow me to give a brief background on why are we having this Mabini Dialogue. Having the world's seventh largest economy with a combined GDP of 2.6 trillion US dollars and a growing population of more than 630 million, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, has been regarded as one of the cornerstones, alongside China, of Asia's gradual ascent as the epicenter of the world's economic activity. It is thus important to gain a broader understanding of the impact of the fourth industrial revolution to ASEAN's community building efforts. The key question would be, how will the unprecedented technological breakthroughs that combine digital, physical, and biological spheres reshape the ASEAN way in open regionalism? It is thus vital to discuss the implications of Industry 4.0 to the Philippines given its standing as one of the founding members of the regional bloc and as one of the best performing economies in the region. Our Mobini Dialogue today will tackle the opportunities and challenges faced by ASEAN and member states as it deepens economic integration in the context of Industry 4.0. The dialogue will also discuss the main considerations for the Philippines as it seeks to sustain economic growth in an Industry 4.0 centric environment with a view of substantially contributing to the development of an ASEAN economic community. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Jay Minon is the economist in the office of the chief economist at the Asian Development Bank in Manila, Philippines, where he works on trade, international investment, and development issues. He joined ADB in 1999 and has worked on the India Desk, the Regional Economic Monitoring Unit, the Southeast Asia Department, in the Office for Regional Economic Integration. Prior to joining ADB, he worked as an academic in Australia for more than a decade, mainly at the Center of Policy Studies at Monash University in Melbourne. He has also worked at the University of Melbourne, Victoria University, and the American University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Minon holds a job appointment with the Australian National University, University of Nottingham, UK, and the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace, and has served on the advisory boards, boards of the University of Nottingham campus in Malaysia and the Cambodian Development Research Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Jay Menon. about the um, 
fourth industrial revolution, um, I uh, agreed uh, mainly because uh, we had finished a report recently uh, with the World Economic Forum on the uh, impacts of the fourth industrial revolution on ASEAN, uh, as well as, as its member countries, including uh, the Philippines. Um, and this was actually launched uh, last year at the ASEAN summit here in Manila um, to the ASEAN heads of state. So we are very pleased uh, to be able to um, present the findings of that study uh, directly to uh, leaders. Um, and uh, we had um, all of them actually present uh, in the room when this report was uh, presented and launched. Um, and um, this wasn't very long ago, but uh, I thought, um, uh, oh, by the way, that report is available for free download um, uh, if you are interested. And in this age of Google, I won't, uh, you know, burden you with a horrible hyperlink. I'll just tell you to Google ADB, WEF, uh, actually that might be even be enough, but if you go ADB, WEF, and 4IR, Fourth Industrial Revolution, you will certainly find a link to the full report. Uh, it's on the ADB website, it's on the World Economic Forum website, and it's also been uh, lifted onto various other websites, so it won't be hard to find. You can get the whole report there, including a, a self-contained executive summary, which I hope uh, you, know, uh, you will look at. Um, okay, so, but uh, I didn't want to just repeat what we had already done, uh, so I thought another interesting dimension that interacts with the fourth industrial revolution uh, is demographic change, right? And we have this happening uh, throughout this region in different ways, right? There are both aging and young societies, and um, the 4IR has implications for how we deal with demographic change, and demographic change itself can impact upon 4IR. So I think it'll be useful to uh, bring both those things together when looking at impacts and responses. And that's what uh, I will try to do uh, today, although I understand that the greater interest is on the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so uh, let me start uh, with the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, are you controlling it or am I? Uh, I am, okay. <laughs> okay, right. With my eyesight, I think I'll look at my notes here while you look at that. <laughs> it might be a bit easier. So I think all of you have uh, heard of the Fourth Industrial Revolution and come across it in different ways. Um, you know, uh, a very broad description would see them uh, defined as uh, a set of highly disruptive technology technologies, and these include AI, uh, robotics, blockchain, 3D printing, and the list goes on and on. Now, uh, the changes that the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, are bringing are by definition revolutionary, uh, and this is not only because of how many sectors they are likely to affect, but also the speed at which they're doing that, right? Um, you know, every time we have a revolution, and this is the fourth, uh, people say, oh, wow, this one is so different from the last. And that's true, but this time it really is. Of course, they said that every time also. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you can be skeptical, but things are changing so fast that it's actually hard to even imagine uh, what it is, let alone what, how it's impacting us, right? Uh, the definition of the Fourth Industrial Revolution is inherently dynamic, and so it is changing, and so trying to keep track of its impacts is a one degree harder problem, right? 
But that doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means that it's going to be harder for us to understand what it is and what it's doing uh, to us. But what it's doing to us is quite clear. It's transforming almost every aspect of our life, right? Social, economic, political, um, every aspect, and in unpredictable ways, okay? Right. Uh, our jobs, our business models, our industrial uh, structures, our, the way in which we interact socially, this may be good, may be bad, uh, but it's happening. And even uh, our systems of governance are now changing because of the uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution. Okay, so let me begin with the uh, likely economic implications, starting with economic growth, right? Again, I just want to repeat this qualification. Uh, this is what we expect, given what we know now, right? And what we understand the 4IR to be as it is today, right? And we have some idea about how it's evolving, but again, the evolution itself is what economists like to call endogenous, right? So uh, its evolution depends on how it's evolving, okay? So this creates a very complex system, uh, and so uh, what might actually happen a year from now could be quite different from what we think what, of what it is today, okay? So just that qualification uh, because of the nature of the beast. Okay, but having said that, uh, I think we should recognize that the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, creates both opportunities as well as challenges, right? Okay, and the opportunities can be great, okay? Um, and they range uh, covering all types of uh, economies from very poor developing countries to the most advanced industrialized nations, right? Uh, but for developing countries like the Philippines, uh, the great opportunity that the 4IR provides is for technological leapfrogging, okay? Uh, so there's many uh, examples of this, but let me just give you um, a couple. Uh, let me give you one which relates to um, uh, ADB. Uh, the work that we are doing in some of our countries. Um, in very poor uh, regions in countries, uh, it is usually very difficult and or expensive to provide uh, links to the electricity grid for electrification, right? Uh, and uh, the 4IR through solar energy provides an opportunity to bypass that huge and expensive infrastructure investment, right? Uh, by creating solar parks in regional remote centers, you can provide self-contained electricity coverage for very isolated regions, right? Uh, the cost of solar panels are forever falling, thanks to the Chinese, uh, who keep producing them cheaper and cheaper, uh, but importantly, the storage, right, the batteries, that's where the high costs are, is also getting better and cheaper. And so this is becoming a real practical option for electrification in remote regions. And all developing countries have remote regions that have, uh, even if they have electricity, it's not reliable electricity. This could either provide them electricity for the first time or supplement existing sources so that the, uh, the unreliability, you know, the brownouts, the word that I learned only after coming to the Philippines, <laughs> the brownouts and also the interruptions by spikes and so on, which can damage equipment, 
computers and cell phones, those things can be moderated by supplementing um, the uh, electricity sources through solar technology in isolated regions. Of course, the most common example um, of leapfrogging is, um, you know, uh, avoiding the, again the high fixed costs of providing landline connectivity uh, and replacing it with mobile phones. Right? Yeah. So that's an obvious advantage, uh, a clear advantage for developing countries, right? But then the 4IR is affecting our productivity in almost everything that we do, right? From the most menial tasks to the most sophisticated service sector uh, industries, right? Uh, it's improving productivity, profitability, right, by reducing costs, sustainability in agriculture, manufacturing, and services, right? Through so better use of scarce resources, replacing non-renewable resources, uh, with renewable ones, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you've uh, come across so many examples, even from reading the newspapers on a daily basis. So uh, ASEAN uh, has tried to estimate uh, the uh, uh, productivity gains uh, that could be unleashed, and they estimate it to range between 220 billion to 625 billion. <laughs> okay, now that's a very wide range, and it reflects the uncertainty about the evolution of the technology itself. And that is supposed to be up to the year 2030. Okay. Let me move on with other economic implications. Uh, 4IR will also expand uh, consumer choice, it will lower costs and raise both the quantity and quality of products and services, right? Um, it will uh, create new ways for us to connect, to trade, uh, to access services, uh, uh, even the ones that are currently being accessed and even new ones that were not available in the past, right? We have all come across, uh, you know, the tremendous changes at Amazon, and Alibaba and all these e-commerce uh, uh, companies have uh, done in affecting our lives. This is likely uh, to continue going forward. But then this greater reliance uh, on uh, digital and online services will also bring new challenges, both to personal uh, security and the security of our private information, okay? Uh, so issues of security, privacy, and intellectual property rights also have to be addressed as we become ever more reliant on uh, digital and online services to conduct so many activities from buying, um, you know, uh, from ordering your lunch to doing your banking, uh, to, uh, you know, um, even uh, uh, booking your holidays in a remote part of the world, okay? So the privacy of that information being transmitted uh, across the uh, international network or the internet is an issue that has to be looked at. You've all uh, heard, I'm sure, about the issues with Facebook, the selling of information and the use of that information in the last election. That is only one example. And of course, uh, this can be magnified, you know, many folds. Uh, again, you heard about probably the breach in British Airways just a few days ago with the hacking of their website and their computer systems with a lot of personal information that can be sold. The reason why people do this is information is valuable and uh, can be used for targeted marketing and this is why hackers are out there doing what they do okay so we'll need to try and guard against those things um, as we become more reliant on the uh, online personalities okay 
Uh, still with economic implications, let me move on to trade investment and global value chains, right? So uh, the 4IR um, and online services, uh, digital technologies can significantly reduce the costs faced by uh, small and medium enterprises, okay? Uh, allowing them to participate in uh, regional and global trade um, when they could never afford to do so in the past, right? For a long time, uh, trade and investment was almost the exclusive domain of large multinationals, okay? Uh, it became synonymous, right? Uh, most of world trade was intra-firm trade between these you know, gigantic companies um, and there were huge startup costs, huge sum costs of engaging in trade. Now that infrastructure uh, that you need to engage in trade is being provided at very low cost through something called the internet, right? And uh, SMEs now all over the world in all remote parts of any region can use the internet to engage in international trade. Okay? And this, I think, is important in increasing the inclusiveness of growth, the challenge that we are all facing uh, as we try to develop, right? The rising disparities between the rich and the poor and uh, the 4IR itself, right, uh, will directly contribute to rising inequality uh, as well as uh, in other ways reduce it. So this is uh, important because it's not just going to increase inequality, there are ways in which it might also help increase inclus inclusiveness, okay? But if uh, artificial intelligence and robotics um, start to replace uh, low-cost, low-skilled labor, then um, this could lead to reshoring of production back to industrialized countries and have uh, quite devastating effects on uh, some, uh, some parts of the developing world, right, in some uh, developing countries. I'll come back to this uh, in a minute, okay, uh, when talking about employment, okay. So again here, FOIR can create new employment opportunities in new industries, uh, uh, expansion of existing industries, and services especially, right, the services sector. Uh, and I don't have to uh, tell the story very vividly here. You all know about the BPO industry here and uh, all its offshoots. Uh, but then, as I was just saying, AI can threaten jobs uh, and the immediate threat uh, will be to low-skilled, repetitive jobs like in um, assembly lines uh, and uh, so forth. But I think we should not forget that people will still need to look, of, look over the robots, right? Uh, when robots start looking over other robots, then we have a different kind of problem. Uh, that could be the end of the world, according to Stephen Hawking. <laughs> uh, if artificial intelligence finally starts becoming human-like. Um, but uh, until then, and hopefully then never happens, uh, people will still have to uh, monitor robots, so uh, while well, it will res displace a lot of jobs, it will not take them all away. Uh, and it might start with the repetitive jobs, but it will move on to uh, more high-skilled jobs over time. In fact, we're already starting to see that uh, in some of the service industries, uh, in diagnostics, um, in the medical field, uh, in the engineering field, in design, and so on and so forth. Right. So let me now talk about uh, uh, a negative aspect, uh, a bit more about a negative aspect, which is important, I think, which is 
the potential for the foreigner to add to inequality. Right? Um, I was just reading yesterday the New World Inequality Report. Uh, it just just come out. Again, free for download if you're interested. Just Google it, World Inequality Report. And the picture gets worse, right? The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Inequality uh, across countries is narrowing, but within countries is growing, okay? ASEAN is a great example, right? The poorest countries are growing quite fast, right? Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam uh, are growing faster than the uh, more developed countries. Except Philippines, actually. Philippines, of course, is still growing very fast, although there's been lately a bit of slowing down, but still the national, uh, the annual growth rate is still quite high. Um, so this faster growth rate is narrowing gaps between countries, but at the same time increasing gaps within countries, right? Yeah. So one type of inequality is reducing one type of inequality is generating another type of inequality. Okay. And the 4IR could accelerate uh, the problem, right? Because uh, returns to highly skilled work and knowledge-based occupations will be increasing faster uh, than other occupations within the country, right? And then there's also, as I said, the possibility, the growing possibility of low-skilled workers losing their work, right? Having to be retrained to take on uh, new uh, tasks. So, um, um, while the gaps between countries are narrowing, as I said, um, inequality, if, it, if the 4IR benefits mainly Singapore, let's say, and no one else, right, then gaps within the region could also grow. Okay? So this is something that they need to try and address. Uh, the more developed countries are already better prepared to deal with the challenges and take advantage of the opportunities. Uh, the poorer countries, including the Philippines, must catch up uh, with preparedness and avoid falling further behind. Okay. Right. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about the 4IR and its economic implications. Now, uh, let me quickly run you through uh, the demographic transitions taking place and then I want to finally come back to discuss the impact and the response together, right? Because I think we shouldn't treat these as separate. Uh, 4IR and demographic transition uh, are related, right? So uh, I would like to discuss uh, their impacts and their responses uh, jointly. Okay, so um, we all, we've heard a lot about aging, uh, a lot of ASEAN is aging, right, uh, a lot of Asia is aging, China is aging quite fast, of course Japan and Korea even more so, but so is Thailand and now Vietnam, uh, Malaysia and Brunei uh, is somewhere in the middle, um, and Philippines actually still has uh, a high fertility rate and uh, still a relatively young population. Okay? Right. Um, but then things can change, right? Transitions can take place unexpectedly fast, and then suddenly you're no longer a young population, but you're suddenly very aging very fast, right? And this has happened in Vietnam, actually, which we thought was a young population, and suddenly you know, uh, th that also changed with rapid changes in fertility rates, right? Okay. Um, right. I'm aware of time, so I'm going to try and move on a bit faster here. Uh, so what are the impacts uh, of aging then? Okay. So I think um, um, just very quickly, we all know that, you know, an aging society uh, means uh, shrinking labor force, right? 
a shrinking labor force will contract your economic growth and eventually your the size of your economy, right? But it will also affect your productivity um, as you go forward and um, in its most advanced form, uh, the so-called demographic dividend becomes a demographic uh, tax, okay? Uh, as the labor force or labor supply contracts. In contrast, uh, younger countries have the potential to earn significant dividends in the years ahead, um, but then the benefits will not come automatically. Okay? Um, so let me, uh, for, for aging again, um, and aging is a very advanced, the challenge is in limiting or replacing the labor shortfall, right? Here, greater automation and other technologies in the 4IR can play a role. And we have seen this happening in Japan, for instance, but also many other countries. Um, uh, aging countries uh, could also try to increase their labor force by facilitating the entry of uh, young adults into the labor force, removing barriers to the participation of women, right? This is a big thing in countries like Japan, right? And also South in Korea. Um, increasing mandatory retirement age, this is what a lot of European countries are doing, or even removing it and adopting more flexible uh, working arrangements. Okay. But for the younger countries like the Philippines, right, uh, currently still relatively young population, um, the challenge is in providing productive employment, okay, uh, for a growing labor force particularly in light of the 4IR and growing automation, okay? So the challenge lies in creating better opportunities at home for people to be uh, employed in decent jobs, paying good wages, okay? So this is also the challenge for India, another young economy in the region, but with a massive population. So everyone talks about the demographic dividend, but there's no dividend unless you can create jobs. Okay? You have to create jobs, uh, sustainable jobs that pay hopefully decent wages, okay, for you to reap the demographic dividend. Um, but I want to um, uh, actually uh, be a bit less pessimistic about the job losses associated with uh, the fourth industrial revolution, okay? There's a, there's a number of doom, doomsday sayers out there, or doomsayers out there, who see massive uh, retrenchment, massive unemployment coming through automation and artificial intelligence, robotics. I think perhaps it's not going to be that bad. This is not to say you shouldn't be uh, getting prepared, but I think uh, if we look at uh, history, with every technological revolution that we've been through, every industrial revolution, what have we observed, right? We've observed that living standards have improved, employment has increased, and we've been better off, okay? Sure, there have been people thrown out of uh, some occupations, but they've been able to be retrained to take on new tasks, okay? So there are uh, adjustment costs, but at the end of the day, we've always been better off, okay? Ever since the first Homo erectus turned a piece of stone uh, into a tool, right? Uh, the first technological revolution, uh, first productivity breaking through, uh, our living standards have improved, okay, over the years. And I see the fourth industrial revolution doing pretty much the same thing in the end, despite all the concerns. 
I think we'll find that, um, as the OECD has found, the number of job losses are probably not going to be as high, right? Uh, of course, that's the developed country analysis. It might be a bit worse in developing countries, but I think there won't be the huge disruptions that people are fearing. Um, and I think it's partly because um, it's easier to predict job losses than to forecast new jobs in industries we no we don't yet um, uh, we don't yet have, right? Uh, so for indus for the industries that will emerge in the future, we don't know what they're going to be yet, but we can see more clearly where jobs might be lost, right? The assembly line type work. So there's this uh, disparity or asymmetry, okay, that might account for the pessimism. Okay, but having said all that, we still need to prepare for the disruption, right? And uh, certainly, uh, the, the uh, we'll hear a lot more about this uh, from our discussant, I'm sure. Uh, what the main thing that we need to do is to invest in ourselves, right? Invest in human capital and to. Uh, to counter the job losses uh, uh, by reskilling, uh, and to do that, I think we require a transformation in education. Uh, this uh, should start with government taking a leadership role, but uh, it has to involve the private sector as well, right? Um, including. Um, firms like uh, Workhorse that you'll hear about soon. Okay. Um, lifelong learning now is no longer a hobby but a necessity. Okay? And um, I think educational systems will have to teach us how to learn to keep learning. Okay? So the days when you learn, when you develop a set of skills and then apply them uh, to your occupation are fast becoming obsolete, okay? So you develop a set of skills that allows you to keep adapting to changing needs. That has become the new uh, requirement, I think, uh, learning how to keep learning in a changing environment rather than uh, you know, specializing in a set of fixed skills is what I think the um, fourth industrial revolution will require. Uh, this is the uh, knowledge-based economy uh, of the future, but the future is rapidly approaching. Okay, and um, I think uh, regional education networks would have to uh, connect uh, more seamlessly. Okay, there are lots of new ways uh, to learn these days um, through the internet, uh, and education systems and networks need to grow to help strengthen that across the region. And there are innovation in the incubators that are being established, including by ASEAN Secretariat, actually, uh, quite uh, interestingly, and I think this is also important uh, going forward. So there's no solution, I think, in the long term than investing in ourselves to better equip ourselves to uh, adapt to these uh, uh, changes, uh, investing in education and skills development. But in the short run, uh, I think, um, and we all live in the short run, right? we can address these challenges by increasing labor mobility, okay? Um, ASEAN countries are still struggling with this issue. It's highly sensitive, um, and of course, they are only dealing with uh, the professions, right? In fact, most of those professions itself, uh, some would argue, are already outdated, right? Given the 4IR. But still, they are struggling to get mutual recognition arrangements for, uh, I think, about 11 
They've got 13 professions. Uh, they're struggling, but they're still working on it. And skilled labor, of course, is not on the table. Yeah. So um, we have to look at uh, how we can speed this up, right? Uh, to uh, allow countries to import the skills that they need, right? Including the 4IR high tech skills. Uh, and when workers are displaced uh, at home by the 4IR, allow them to also move within the region to try and take up new opportunities, especially given the demographic transitions. So young populations can help supplement shrinking labor supplies in aging populations, okay, if they are allowed to move more freely within the region. And this is where regional cooperation has to play a role. And I would like to end uh, with this point. Um, and this is where ADB also tries to support regional institutions like ASEAN, uh, APEC, uh, and now we're talking about the RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which brings in the plus six countries uh, to work with ASEAN. Right, the plus six, uh, of course, Australia, New Zealand, India, China, Japan, and Korea. Right, uh, we hope that our set will be concluded this year. Okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, pressure now to try and get it concluded. We know the TPP now has been reconfigured uh, without the US to become the CPTPP. Uh, that's also facing challenges. Malaysia is reconsidering its participation. And so RCEP might uh, pick up and fill that gap uh, going forward. But uh, there is a role for regional uh, cooperation in dealing with both the 4IR and uh, demographic change. And um, uh, while a lot of changes will have to happen, in fact, most of the changes will have to happen at the national level, regional, uh, regional uh, organizations and institutions can play a complementary role. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize and finish up by uh, looking at the bottom line, okay? So I think, um, uh, to conclude, the impact of the 4IR combined with the demographic transition will be very difficult to predict accurately, right? We can uh, broadly uh, forecast uh, the trends, but this is a moving target, okay? Nevertheless, right, uh, we have to uh, start responding to these broad trends immediately, right? And the impact will depend on how we respond, right? What policies we change, what institutions uh, we create in, re in response to these challenges, okay? And they're both uh, opportunities and challenges, okay? Uh, there are things to be gained as well if you can grasp the opportunities uh, and not just focus on the negative side, right? So policymakers at both the national and regional levels will need to start refashioning the institutions and policies, and they need to do so starting now. Okay, I think I'll stop there uh, and look forward to the comments from my discussants and also to your questions, hopefully, uh, later on. So thank you. Thank you for your patience. I hope I didn't speak too long, actually. Less than one hour. Uh, so thank you once again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Menon, for the comprehensive discussion on the impact of uh, 4 IR on ASEAN. Now, allow me to introduce our discussant and to give us a brief uh, uh, brief uh, description on how is the private sector adopting to the 4 industrial revolution. 
Mr. Ray Naldo Lugto Jr., uh, Mr. Uh, Ray Lugto, is the president and CEO of Hungry Workers, a digital and culture transformation consultancy firm, and he's also the co-founder and counter of Cocos Inc., a data privacy and business advisory firm. He has engaged with several companies and organizations on digital transformation and innovation, helping them in strategy and execution. He is also the chairman, independent director, co-founder, and advisor of several startup and tech companies. Mr. Lugtu previously held senior executive roles in Microsoft, Samsung, Globe Telecom, Emerson, and IBM. He is a professional lecturer in the MBA program of Tele Salle University and was adjunct faculty of Asian Institute of Management, where he taught digital transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome, warm welcome to Mr. Rinaldo Lugtu. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So that was really insightful, uh, Dr. J. Mayon. Huh? So um, yeah, we learned a lot and it's actually validation of the things uh, I will also share. Huh? Now the fourth industrial revolution is indeed impacting the way we live, we work, and we play. Huh? Uh, and uh, you know, I couldn't agree more with uh, Dr. Menon uh, in saying that it affects all aspects of society uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, unpredictable, uh, because it, uh, you know, it gives you a way, it paves the way for opportunities as well as challenges. What I will do is supplement what Dr. Menon, uh, you know, shared, uh, with the micro view of wha what's happening, uh, uh, especially globally and uh, uh, locally. Now uh, we saw this headline early this year when. Toys R Us closed their shops in the U.S. Another casualty of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, you know, forcing companies who are unable to adapt to close shop. Now, a lot of companies are at the brink of uh, closure because of uh, the inability to adapt. And uh, we see this uh, happening. You know, like in 2017, most of the companies in the top, uh, you know, S&P 500 are the traditional oil and utility companies but in uh, just uh, a decade many of them has been replaced by uh, companies in the tech sector uh, mainly in the you know mainly uh, doing the business in the business of data that's why data has become now the new oil so data is now the currency of business in this age of the fourth industrial revolution and we see a lot of headlines, uh, you know, impacting uh, various industries and even professions. Uh, many of these technologies are affecting, uh, you know, how industries and businesses operate, uh, compete, and even how professionals uh, conduct their jobs. Now, the fourth industrial revolution uh, is a an amalgamation of the different technologies, as mentioned by Dr. Menon. Now, all of these are, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, groundbreaking technologies, but some of them are applications of old technologies, which are resurfacing right now, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, in the areas of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, analytics. So, as Dr. Menon sh uh, shared, you know, there are opportunities and challenges, and he, uh, you know, ably shared the opportunities in productivity, you know, lowering the barriers uh, you know, between markets, improved quality of lives, and innovative uh, technologies be you know, melding uh, between the scientific and technical. The challenges involve uh, you know, inequality, cybersecurity and hacking, also mentioned by Dr. Menon, and new ethical concerns. Uh, you know, this is an emerging issue uh, because of technology, a lot of eth uh, ethical issues are emerging. Uh, you wouldn't believe that uh, you know, there are many apps now uh, you know, trying to replace the traditional uh, practices that uh, many of us are used to. Like there's, a, I heard there's an app already, there's a robotic priest available in Europe. <laughs> now the implications in business and management I will discuss using this uh, system approach. Now uh, we talk about the industry level organization level and leadership and management level. 
Now we start with in the street. No? And again, just uh, you know, uh, reiterating what Dr. Minot said, no? in the supply side, no, it will uh, result in the creation of new ways of serving existing needs, improvement on the quality and speed and price and value of the uh, being delivered. No? Now we see this happening in the Philippines. No? The, you know, the logistics industry is becoming the next sunrise industry in the Philippines because uh, you know, there's huge potential to, uh, to be gained in terms of efficiency you know, in the logistics sector. So you see uh, you know, large conglomerates investing heavily in logistics companies. You have SM buying into to go, uh, you have Ayala you know, moving into warehousing, and even Cebu Pacific converting their planes into charter cargo planes. Right. Uh, on the demand side, uh, there's uh, growing transparency, more uh, consumer engagement, and new patterns of consumer behavior. No? Consumer behavior that we probably uh, haven't seen, no? like uh, you know, consumers interacting with uh, AIs and robots. Those are going to be new patterns of consumer behavior. Now let's move to the organization level. Now, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution uh, you know, brings forth a concept called digital transformation. Now, digital transformation is the strategic response of organizations to uh, the opportunities and threats uh, brought forth by the fourth industrial revolution. We define this simply as this. It's the acceleration of uh, activities, processes, and competencies to take advantage of technologies in a strategically aligned way. Now, digital transformation is not about technology. You know, technology is the last piece in any digital transformation. Now, my company, Hungry Workers, have been uh, consulting with several local companies in the Philippines. And it's a big realization uh, that, uh, for me that uh, you know, local companies view digital transformation in a te technology way, when in fact it's not. It's about uh, you know, uh, building capabilities, that will, uh, you know, uh, help companies capitalize on the fourth IR and even ward off threats, uh, you know, uh, coming because of the fourth IR. Now, I offer a framework for companies to uh, fully maximize the use of digital transformation in the midst of the fourth IR. In any company, there are four components. No? The first component is operations, you know, product, customer experience, and uh, employees and probably which is the most important component and then uh, you know for uh, digital transformation is all about building capabilities that will help companies capitalize opportunities in the fourth IR after uh, determining the capabilities that you need as an organization it's now time to look at technologies technologies that will uh, you know help the uh, you know deliver the capabilities of the organization now we will discuss one by one, like uh, in the profit model, the way your company makes money. An example is how Netflix changed the business model of uh, video rental from uh, you know, the usual renting to subscription. Network, how uh, companies connect to, the, uh, to other organizations to create value. An example is how Uber created a fleet of cars without owning a single asset of car. Structure, how companies now are using uh, artificial intelligence to replace workers. It's happening now in many first world countries like in Japan. Uh, you know, this example, an insurance uh, company uh, changed their uh, you know, as office workers into artificial intelligence robots. No? Not physical robots, but automating the processes. No? Process, no? signature methods. An example is how Zara is using analytics to uh, churn out fast fashion. You know, they're able to uh, bring forth new fashion clothing in just a matter of weeks. The product, the product performance, how uh, Samsung creates new innovative appliances, no? like uh, an internet-connected refrigerator that enables you to monitor uh, you know, the inventory of the rep. No? So I think this will be applicable in Philippines. No? Product system, how UPS 
uh, in Philippines, if you can remember loom bands, when loom bands were fashionable, uh, you know, uh, UPS Philippines, uh, you know, discovered that they, they saw the pattern that uh, the Philippines has been importing loom bands and, uh, you know, it's causing much delay because of the demand. So they decided to, why not 3D print it? No? And this offering now is a, uh, you know, is a regular offering of UPS all over the world. No? When uh, someone orders a plastic or even rubber or any uh, material, no? material that can be 3D printed. No? Service. No? How hotels now are using robots, like physical robots, to help uh, you know, enhance customer experience. How uh, you know, uh, Amazon is uh, innovating the channel, how grocery items are delivered to consumers by uh, implementing a just, just walk out technology. Imagine this store you know, without any cashier or vent, uh, you know, salesperson inside. No? You just have to get your uh, uh, grocery item and walk out. Again, not possibly applicable in Philippines. No? <laughs> Brand, how uh, Virgin is able to uh, capitalize on branding. Nowhere in the world can you find any brand that is named uh, after a single brand, Virgin. And in fact, Virgin now is named after uh, you know, a technology called Hyperloop. This Hyperloop uh, technology is uh, able to transport people from one place to another, you know, which are normal, which is normally taken, uh, which normally takes hours to travel via airplane. Customer engagement: How IKEA is using augmented reality to help their clients choose and even visualize furniture. So all of these uh, examples are changing you know, the way we consume. Now, lastly, you know, uh, employee uh, employees, you know, uh, company in Germany is using uh, artificial intelligence to align culture with the hiring practices. A lot of companies now are using AI to help uh, companies select the best candidate. Now, these examples uh, are, are clear indicators of the impact of the fourth IR and the uh, opportunities that uh, are present as well as the challenges that face the current uh, the companies especially in the philippines now what's the state of digital transformation in the philippines and in the region now uh, when i was in microsoft a few years ago uh, we conducted a study in the region and i'll share you some studies now uh, the philippines uh, according to this survey you know, 43% are in progress with specific strategy. 32% have a full strategy in place when it comes to digital transformation. Compare that to Asia. Asia you know, has a, a lower full strategy. Uh, so I don't actually believe this statistic because I believe that a lot of companies in the Philippines are, you know, do not have the strategy. You know. The main issue among Filipino companies why there's difficulty in implementing digital transformation to capitalize on opportunities and ward of threats is the lack of leadership, lack of digital leadership. No? I've, uh, you know, we've been working with several companies and that's the main challenge of the CEO. It's to look for someone who will lead their organizations to digitally transform and capitalize on the Ford IR. There's no one. There's no one uh, in the Philippines, no? right? So that's the main issue uh, of uh, organizations in the Philippines. Compare that to the rest of Asia, the main issue of uh, police in the, the rest of Asia is cybersecurity. And the last issue they have is leadership, no? digital leadership, no? which is amazing. No? It's the opposite. Now, the main uh, when it comes to initiatives, companies in the Philippines prioritize customer engagement when it comes to uh, digital transformation. When it comes to technology, you know, artificial intelligence is top of mind, including Internet of Things. That's why you see a lot of companies now moving into chatbots, the simplest form of AI to improve customer service. Now, the, you know, despite all of these digital transformation initiatives uh, all over the world and in the Philippines, the main barrier is culture. Culture is the single biggest barrier in any transformation. So culture will also 
prevent us Filipinos from uh, an awarding of threats of the fourth IR. Now I offer this framework now, the framework of the Spande that describes the four types of culture. So in any company there will be different amounts of clan, advocacy, hierarchy and market. Right? Advocacy is all about creativity, risk taking, clan is all about teamwork, market is all about competitiveness and hierarchy is all about rules and order. Now according to several studies in the, in the last year, those companies who uh, are able to capitalize on the fourth IR and digital transformation displayed strong shared sense of purpose, freedom to experiment, distributed decision making, and open to the influence of the external world. Those cultures are uh, you know, advocacy and clan cultures. All right, it's more about risk taking and uh, being collaborative. What's interesting in the Philippines now, I've been doing this survey in Philippine uh, companies and organizations. Filipino companies pay, uh, you know, display high clan culture. It's natural for us. We are a clanish culture. No? All right? But uh, also high hierarchy. No? Because the, uh, you know, many of the organizations in Philippines are family companies. Hence, the, uh, the need to, uh, to have authoritarian rule. No? Advocacy is very low. You know, a lot of uh, respondents uh, lament uh, how low uh, risk taking and uh, you know uh, entrepreneurial spirit is uh, in, in uh, many organizations. Market aggressiveness is medium. All right. So this is the current state of many organizations. You now I did this survey in one conference with uh, 100 plus samples. And uh, if you ask them what they what they need in the future. No, they require a you know, the same amount of clan, less hierarchy, more advocacy, and some improvement in the market. So Filipino uh, organization members and employees, they, we clamor for more risk taking, you know, more entrepreneurial spirit, and less bureaucracy. That's a clamor in private sector organizations. But the problem we have you know, in Philippines, you know, despite the clan, us being a clan culture, is that uh, you know, we are clannish in our departments, but we display silo mentality across departments, which is still bad uh, because silo mentality is hard to measure. No? Uh, it cannot be measured by any uh, employee engagement survey. No? You see organizations displaying high employee engagement, but uh, no, but still no, there's there's uh, no, there's a problem with how they collaborate and communicate. Silo is a big problem in many organizations in the Philippines. What are the skills required in this day and age of the fourth IR? Now, according to studies of Google, two decades long of study, uh, and this is aligned to what uh, Dr. Menon said, uh, you know, you have to have the basic STEM. But more important than the basic STEM are soft skills, like critical thinking, problem solving, collaborating, being a communicator. And I sum this in the Philippine context, I created a framework that is suitable for Philippines no? when it comes to enabling Filipino employees. We need to display more empathy, collaboration, and complex problem solving and agile decision making. All of these skills are required so that uh, no, an employee will not be replaced by a robot. No? Uh, I've seen many organizations, especially in the service sector, uh, you know, uh, one sector I, we studied is the insurance industry. Uh, especially when you uh, visit a branch of an insurance uh, uh, company. Uh, when you transact with this branch, you know, the, te the agents are like robots. No? They don't look at you, they just ask you questions. No? So, you know, I tell myself I'd rather talk to a robot with consistent service quality than to uh, an empathic human being. No? Right? So empathy is critical no? uh, in Filipinos. We are naturally empathic as Filipino culture but we need to turn it on and channel it correctly. No? Collaboration is also important. Again, we are naturally collaborative as, as a culture, no? but we collaborate only with our friends. No? In our departments, within our division, we don't collab collaborate across other departments. This is where silo mentality is uh, evident. And then lastly, complex problem solving. No? Complex problem solving is necessary according to WEF, uh, you know, this is the critical, the number one critical skill in the uh, fourth industrial revolution. 
uh, because of the amount of data we, we consume and we use, there's a need to uh, decide based on ill-defined problems. And complex problem solving uh, is composed of three components, critical thinking, creativity, and data analytics. Critical thinking, uh, uh, no, sorry, Lee, we are getting low in critical thinking. Uh, uh, you know, based on a study last, uh, last year by the Perils of Perception study, we, are, we were listed as the third most ignorant country in the world. No? But we are also listed the third most confident in the world. <laughs> you know, a phenomenon called Kruger-Dunning effect. No? The more uh, ignorant you are, the more confident you are. And this uh, correlates with uh, our standing as the fourth happiest country. No? We are fourth. So uh, this justifies the saying, ignorance is bliss. No? <laughs> right? We are also the third most emotional country in the world. No? Studies show that uh, you know, uh, uh, high ignorance is correlated to high emotion. No? Right. So the intersections are naturally communication and teamwork. All right. Now let's talk about impact on leadership. Now uh, leaders are required now to look at companies and organizations on a system-wide level. There's a need to look at uh, organizations where they operate on a system uh, level where uh, you know, they uh, evaluate inputs versus outputs. And there's a need also to uh, look after sustainability of the enterprise. Strategic management is changing. Uh, gone are the traditional ways of managing, like SWOT, you know, five forces. I teach strategic management in Lasal MBA. Uh, I still teach those concepts, but uh, you know, I supplement with new age concepts uh, in strategic uh, planning and management. There's a need for strategies to be more responsive, more flexible, and adaptive. Decision making. So, uh, you know, AI is going to replace much of our mundane decision making. Uh, so what's going to be left for uh, leaders and managers and professionals are high level decision making. Those that involve complex problem solving. Ethics is going to be an issue. Uh, there's going to be a lot of gray areas in ethics. Imagine uh, you know, an, AI, an autonomous car no? in the U.S. Autonomous car in the U.S. No? last year no? reported uh, uh, hitting a woman or an old woman. Imagine the uh, ethical ramifications of that incident. No? Who's accountable? Is it the programmer? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the agent? No? So interesting questions and interesting times. No? So I propose uh, you know, a type of governance that, uh, you know, that evaluates every step of the technology adoption. All right. Conclusions: We must all embrace afford IR, no? and all sectors of society should prepare no? the public and private sector. No? Businesses should capitalize on the afford IR, and there's a need. There's an urgent need for digital leadership. No? So if you uh, want to be a digital leader, no, you don't need to understand programming no, or tech. You just need to understand technology in broad terms. And, and, and uh, the most important in Fort IR is culture and behavior. Build a culture that embraces Fort IR. We need a culture in the Philippines among organizations such as uh, risk-taking, entrepreneurial spirit, and collaboration apart from uh, being competitive in the market. That's all, and thank you for listening.